Thank you so much, and, and uh, it is uh, wonderful to be here tonight. We appreciate you coming out, and we appreciate uh, uh, most of you have been coming to every single one of these series, and it has been uh, exciting for us and an eye-opener for us, as, and we hope uh, as well for you. Uh, tonight, uh, our topic is the First Amendment, and it's appropriate because when we first uh, began focusing on a Facts Matter initiative at the newspaper. This was probably three, four years ago, and you know, primarily aimed at uh, so much uh, news and information out there that is that is uh, untrue. Uh, but we were really motivated, I think, because we felt at the time that uh, that the uh, news media and the press is under assault. And one of the things that we wanted to drive home was just uh, the important relevance of the news media uh, to our society and our, and our country. And so that's why uh, its role in, in the republic, we believe, is important. Uh, can I ask, uh, I imagine being in the newspaper business, I'm more, uh, I embrace newspaper movies uh, more than most people do, but can I ask uh, people to shout out your favorite newspaper movie? I'll, <clears throat> absence of Malice, All the President's Men, Spotlight, others, The Front Page, The Post, Shattered Glass. I'm not sure I'm familiar with that one. Quick summary. He got caught stealing uh, glass, and the reporter is uh, the reporter was doing what? <laughs> Stephen Glass. Oh, okay. All right. I completely missed it. Boom. Did anybody mention the front page? Yes. And how about the paper? Certainly, two of my favorites. I also like uh, Deadline USA. Uh, how many of you have seen Deadline USA? This is a real movie that people went to the movies to see. Uh, you can't find it on TV. It's hard to find even, even on Amazon, but I encourage you to find it. Hum it's a Humphrey Bogart movie. It's a classic Humphrey Bogart movie. And Humphrey Bogart is the uh, editor of a dying newspaper called The Day. And the movie is... Uh, is uh, well, the movie is the classic romance of uh, of the uh, newspaper industry, out fighting uh, out fighting uh, evil even onto its onto its last day. I think it was fifty one. I think it was fifty one, and it's good, and it's got a, some classic Bogart lines. If I could do a Bogart impression, I would uh, tell them for you. But one of the great lines is because. Even though they're about to go out of business, uh, a reporter comes in to interview for a job. And uh, so Bo Bogart talks to him and says, so, you want to be a reporter, huh? Well, let me tell you, it's not the world's oldest profession, but it's the best. I encourage you, I encourage you to go see, go see it. What, what? Deadline USA. It is one of my uh, one of my favorites, and um, just as no hands came went up here, normally when I talk about it, even in the newsroom, few people have heard about it. So another romantic, one of our most romantic founders in terms of eloquence and poetry, and was uh, Thomas Jefferson, and and Jefferson. Uh, uh, I had several, several quotes about the, the, uh, pr about the press. Uh, I mean, if you go uh, looking things up, I spoke about the, the free press uh, often. His, probably his most famous uh, quote, because newspapers everywhere tend to uh, run it, is, 
We're left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government. I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Uh, so newspapers, of course, love that quote. Shortly after he became president, though, there's this quote, nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. Um, but this is uh, really my favorite uh, quote uh, uh, from uh, Jefferson. No experiment can be more interesting than that we are now trying, and which we trust will end in establishing the fact that man may be governed by reason and truth. Our first object should therefore be to leave open to him all the avenues to truth. The most effectual hitherto found is the freedom of the press. It is, therefore, the first shut up by those the first shut up by those who fear the investigation of their actions. And the reason I, I love this quote is the emphasis on that uh, man, they only worried about men back then, uh, that man may be governed by reason and truth. Our, the whole concept of uh, freedom of, of press is that, <clears throat> the whole concept of freedom of press is that if if truth and lies are thrown at the populace, that the populace is wise enough to uh, decide between them. And this really implies that there is an obligation on all of us as citizens of the republic uh, <clears throat> to search out the truth for ourselves, to search out the truth for ourselves and not to take well, virtually not take anything at, hell, at face value, whether it agrees with us or, or doesn't. Uh, wonderful, wonderful quote from uh, Jefferson. And of course, then there's this quote from uh, Vladimir Lenin, who is not quite such a fan of uh, freedom of the press. Why should any, why should freedom of the speech and freedom of press be allowed? Why should a government which is doing what it believes to be right, allow itself to be criticized. It would not allow opposition by lethal weapons. Ideas are much more fatal things than guns. Why should any man be allowed to buy a printing press and disseminate pernicious opinions calculated to embarrass the government? And there is probably anyone who has ever been in elected office or powerful in a position of power has, has probably had this same impulse and no ma at some time or another, as Jefferson uh, kind of did. Uh, but uh, we need to recognize that the press is here to provide the thorny check on, on power. And maybe not always right, maybe certainly not always pleasant, uh, but a necessary uh, component. So, so we're here today to talk about the First Amendment. There will, be a, there will be a quiz. We're in a school, after all. Uh, but first, let's get to uh, some of the fundamentals. And so we start with this question. Are we a democracy? Uh, can we get an answer to that? Republic, Democratic Republic? Okay. Anybody want to argue that we're a, de a democracy? The woman up front says she doesn't think we're any longer a democracy. Never were back here. Any other thoughts related to this? Famous, famous line as uh, Franklin is coming out of the Constitutional Convention, where uh, a woman asked him, well, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? Uh, because back then it was viewed as there's only two things, there's only two forms of government, republics or democracies. And uh, Franklin famously replied, a republic, if you can, if you can keep it. If, if, you, uh, read the, uh, if you read the literature, there is considerable debate over whether we're a democracy or a, a republic. Um, uh, some experts will describe us as a democratic uh, republic, some a uh, representative democracy. Some will say we're both a republic and a democracy. And a democracy. But there's a question. 
Here are a couple of things for you to ponder. If we were a democracy, how do you explain Michael Madigan? I mean, how, how what power do you have to uh, elect Michael Madigan the speaker? Or if we're a democracy, why would there be an electoral college? Or a Senate? Or, or gerrymandering? Or the Supreme Court? All, all these are the results of representative, uh, representative gov government. The founders uh, generally were fairly distrustful of the common people, fairly distrustful. And the, there were debates there was debates among them in terms of how much power to trust in the hands of uh, the people. And there was tension then as there's tension today between kind of people who lean towards the republic and people who lean towards democracy. And, it's no, and, it, and it is no accident that our two parties are called Republican and uh, Democratic, uh, Democratic parties. In many ways, we have, seen a, we have seen a trend since the birth of the nation towards more democracy. Women were not allowed the right to vote. There was slavery back then. Uh, there are all sorts of obstacles even after slavery for, uh, for uh, blacks and other minorities to vote. All these things uh, today have, uh, ch have uh, changed. And, um, well, to one degree or another, I mean, I think you can debate how much they've changed, but to one degree or, no, or another. Uh, but you can also argue that uh, there have been anti-democratic things that have happened, that, uh, the, that the political parties uh, exert much more uh, power than they used to have back at the, uh, back at the, birth, of the uh, birth of the nation. So uh, next question, are we free? Is this, is this the land of the free? There's a yes here. More than other countries. Any other thoughts about it? And less than other countries to some degree. Any other thoughts about that back here? But we cannot do it without laws that govern it. We're free to drive Pretty an good automobile. Description. But we can't do it without laws to govern how we do it. Yeah. Pretty good description. A any other thoughts or comments on that? Okay. So there's, a, there's an organization called F uh, Freedom House. It was created uh, back in 1941, a, a couple of months before Pearl Harbor, actually. The first uh, co-chairs of it were uh, Eleanor Roosevelt and Wendell, Wendell Wilkie. It was really created partly to generate support for uh, possible war effort, um, and um, for over 75 years, this organization, which critics say leans towards uh, favors the the U.S., so if anything, they favor the U.S. But uh, for 75 years, they have rated uh, uh, rated uh, countries based on the amount of freedom they have, and um, we didn't spell out one, two, and three. As a Scandinavian, I can proudly say that one, these are the flags for Sweden, Norway, and Finland. And they're all tied for first in the, the latest uh, uh, Freedom of the World poll from uh, 2018. The United States uh, is considered free, but it comes in at, it comes in at, nine, at 51. Uh, Mexico less free come, uh, and uh, partly free, as I think is their description. It comes in at 103. Russia comes in at uh, 179, and does anybody want to guess? Well, you can read, I guess, so you don't have to. As long as you can read, you're not guessing. The last on the list is uh, Syria, so 200, 210, uh, 210 countries. So um, I think they knocked, uh, they knocked the U.S. down. Um, well, here, here's a quote from uh, them. In recent years, its, uh, its democratic institutions have suffered erosion as reflected in partisan manipulation of the electoral process, bias and dysfunction in the criminal justice system, and growing disparities in wealth, economic opportunity, and political, political influence. Uh, if you read the detail of their report, uh, you know, there are several things they point out, but one of them is the dysfunction in our Congress, where Congress really doesn't work together uh, uh, work together uh, anymore. 
So if you think in terms of how free we are, we are, you know, we are a very free country. But if you run as a third party, what are, what are on a third party ticket? What are your chances of getting elected? Uh, there are some restrictions on uh, voting, different uh, at, at various states. Uh, uh, campaign financing can pose uh, limitations. Um, uh, in terms of freedom, you know, you can't buy drug, any drug you want to on the street. Uh, in most states, uh, prostitution is illegal. Polygamy is illegal. And of course, we've got the Electoral College, congressional dysfunction, uh, uh, equality issues, uh, those types of things. So uh, how about if we hand it over to uh, Jim, who's going to get us to the Constitution so we get closer to the First Amendment. OK, I started life as a teacher when I first graduated from college, so um, John had me uh, do the hard part and give you the quiz. Um, uh, but we'll make it an easy one. It's not a, we're not here to embarrass anybody or, um, uh, or anything like that, but I would like to start a discussion about the Constitution by making sure that we understand it well and uh, that we're all sort of on the same page. So let me throw out some questions and, and see uh, uh, what we know. Uh, first of all, uh, how many think the Constitution was, uh, uh, was signed in 1776? What year was the Constitution signed? Okay. Actually, the Constitutional Convention that, that started it was 1787. Um, it was ratified um, a year later in 1788. Uh, how, many, how many of the 13 colonies participated in the Constitutional Convention? Some say 11, some say 12. What, um, does anybody think all 13 participated? I, I always think this is interesting because people talk about what geniuses the founding fathers were and what a great job they did in, in, in crafting this wonderful constitution that we have. And of course we do love it and we do believe that it has stood the test of time for all the right reasons. But at the time, it was a very divisive document and of the 13 colonies, only 12 participated in the, uh, uh, in the actual Constitutional Convention. Anyone know which one did not? Close. Rhode Island. Rhode Island did not. Um, New Hampshire actually was late arriving to the uh, Constitutional Convention. Um, uh, there are um, several founding fathers who participated. We all talk about the founding fathers. Um, can you name uh, a a famous one who didn't attend the convention. Monroe, uh, I don't believe he was there actually, but I don't remember. I have three in, in mind who are really considered kind of the fathers of our government. One is Thomas Jefferson, who was in France at the time. The other was John Adams. And another was John Jay, who was not talked about a lot, but who was, who was really um, uh, important in creating the Federalist Papers and some other things. Um, who was considered the father of the Constitution? James Madison, anyone else? James Madison, and James Madison does ha have that title. Okay, but if he was the father, who was the penman of the Constitution? If anyone gets this, um, I'll buy you a cup of coffee afterwards. The penman of the Constitution is Governor Morris. Governor Morris was a... Uh, a delegate from New York, a very uh, active patriot. As you read about the revolution, you, his name crops up all the time. Um, and uh, um, he wrote the famous preamble, the, the part of the Constitution that most of us remember the most, uh, he, he wrote himself. Um, and finally, uh, does the Constitution declare that all men are created equal? No, in fact, it says that some men are only worth three-fifths of what others are worth. Um, so th those are just some interesting facts. Let me add one, one other thing. Uh, how, is the con how is the Constitution improved from year to year or changed through amendments? Um, is there any other way to amend the Constitution? 
Supreme Court decisions. Any other ideas, thoughts? Actually, the only other one that I'm aware of is Article 5, which declares that uh, with uh, a vote of three-fifths of the states, um, a constitutional convention can be held and the Constitution can be revised or re be rewritten. That is not um, uh, carefully spelled out exactly how that would happen or what happens, um, but there are some groups, in, in fact, um, 12 states so far have, uh, ratified, have passed amendments calling for such a convention, and there is a move to, to create another one to rewrite our Constitution or at least review it. So you might want to keep that in mind. <laughs> okay, and now a quiz on the First Amendment itself. This one will be much shorter. First of all, um, tell me if this is uh, um, if this is a freedom that is that is guaranteed by the First Amendment. Um, freedom of speech. How many say say yes? Um, how many say freedom of religion? How many say uh, freedom of the press? Okay. How many say uh, the right to bear arms? How many say uh, the right to vote? How many say the right to petition the government? How many say the right uh, to protest and assemble. Okay, uh, it's an interesting uh, grouping. I'll tell you in just in just a moment um, some some figures about that. But there are five freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment, and those five freedoms are: this is the amendment itself. Uh, first, freedom of religion. Notice that. An important part of that is that, that the uh, government will not make any establishment of religion. Freedom of speech, freedom of press, the freedom of assembly. Uh, notice that it says the freedom to peaceably assemble. And the freedom to petition for redress of grievances. Um, it was interesting to see the hands that went up. I'm not sure how many of, of you could see all of the hands, but uh, the, first, the Freedom Forum, which is an an agency, a think tank that studies the Constitution and other aspects of, of freedom in America, did a survey just this year to see how many people could identify <coughs> the freedoms that are guaranteed in the First Amendment. And um, of those people uh, that it, uh, it surveyed, 40% couldn't name a single one. 56% said freedom of speech was in there. Um, 15% said freedom of religion, they're right. 13% said freedom of the press, they were right. Only 12% said right of assembly. Um, and only 2% said right to petition. And I have to admit that every time I have this question or I sit down to talk with somebody about it, I can immediately knock off four and like, what is that last one? What is that last one? And it's the freedom to, to petition. Um, and many people said right to vote, which is not in there. And many people said the right to bear arms, which is also not the first. Of the, and these are the numbers I'm sorry I just read. An interesting fact about our freedoms and what we think about them and what we think about the First Amendment, also in a survey in 2016 and another one in 2018, the Freedom Forum asked people, does the First Amendment go too far? Do we have too much freedom? In 2016, 28% uh, of the people, more than a quarter, said yes, we have too many freedoms too much freedom in this country. Um, uh, two years later, that number was down to 23%. Interesting, what has changed between 2016 and 2018? President Trump, among many other things probably, and you know, maybe there's no relationship there whatsoever, but it is interesting to me to, to note is when all the criticism that the president gets, people now tend to think that we're more free than, than we were two years ago. Uh, freedom Forum, the same group that I just mentioned that studies um, freedom issues, yes. 
freedom of speech, how much freedom of speech do we really have? One of the uh, real issues of today is should certain people be forbidden from speaking on campuses because what they say is too incendiary, might upset too many people, or might create riots or cause problems. And there are, uh, have been many uh, speakers who've been forbidden to, to speak on campuses. How can we say we have freedom of speech if our universities of all places won't allow them to speak? And yet, uh, if, you, if you look at the question that Freedom of Form asked, which was, uh, should universities forbid speakers who are apt to offend? If a speaker is going to offend you, should I still allow them to come? 19% uh, 19, 19 strongly agreed that they should be forbidden. Forbidden, they should not be allowed to speak. 19% said that. Um, another 23% said, yeah, I think so. I, I somewhat agree with that. So 42%, not quite half of the people, were willing to keep people from speaking in a free country. Um, and 55%, if you look at how many actually disagreed. So we're still over half, still want to allow freedom of speech on campuses. But, uh, but it's an, un, uh, to me, somewhat surprisingly close uh, connection. Some other ways uh, I might ask about how free our press is. Because the freedom of press has a couple of different elements. One is, what can the government stop you from doing? The other is, what can somebody else stop you from doing or saying? Obviously, a campus, a college campus, may think that they can, can keep you from speaking, but um, it can't be a government policy, necessarily. Um, but the uh, World Press Freedom In Index, a agency that studies this over the course of, of many years, has looked at countries to see how, how free our presses are uh, compared to each other. Um, basically, it looks at um, how much pluralism there is, how, how much um, people uh, accept other, other people within the society, how much media independence there is, uh, how much legislative support there is for free press and um, safety. And they go out and they take a questionnaire every year and they send it out to uh, each of 180 countries and ask people in those countries who, are, who deal with the press um, questions about uh, what makes them, them free. And then they create a score based on that and, and they create the document that you see here that shows uh, sort of where press is free and where it's not. Um, if you look at the white countries, and what might you notice about them that Mr. Lampinen will be proud of, uh, the Scandinavian countries that tend to be the ones that are most free. Um, uh, where the yellow countries are those that um, are fairly good. The orange are ones where it's getting a little dicey. Red means there's not much freedom of press, almost none. And the black means it's really bad. So you can see where in the world kind of how that breaks out. Um, let me note some countries in the list. You can see here on, on this, you know, where certain countries land. Norway is number one, the United States number 45. Some countries that, um, that are ahead of us include Jamaica, which is number six, uh, Costa Rica, which is number 10. How many would expect to see that? Um, Canada, number 18, our neighbor to the north. Um, former, co former communist countries, Latvia, number 24, the Czech Republic, number 34. South Africa, number 28. Chile, number 38. So it's kind of interesting to think of ourselves as a free country when you start looking at, at how some of these break out. This is this year's, and this is done annually. It is disastrous, disastrous. South Africa, who uh, actually um, fed half of um, Africa, now it is fascism, moreover. It is racism. It is black racism mm -hmm. against white people. White people live under the uh, uh, un, uh, under the uh, uh, over the fence, and they are afraid of their life. And is is the same time it is uh, more freedom of press than in the United States. I don't believe in this one. Um, we do have certain restrictions. But, you know, I would say, and, and I would emphasize that, that we're number 45. We're in the green. We're in the fairly free. So 
the difference between number one and number 45 on this scale probably is not really that great. The difference between number 45 and number 180, I'm sure, is, is very high if you compare it us to, to Syria or those that are, that are last. Uh, I, will, I will just jump in to uh, <coughs> respond to that. For, at first, I agree with Jim that you know, we're, we're relatively free uh, here and relatively uh, good access to news and information and not uh, intimidated. Uh, but there certainly are, are cases where transparency could be better. Uh, we've got a fairly, uh, you know, <clears throat> the uh, Freedom of Information Act was born in the United States. So we've got f fairly good access to public information, but we don't have complete access to public information. And particularly, particularly uh, <clears throat> there's, there are areas within the court system or within county government, or frankly, there's a, a lot within... <clears throat> You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, public access to a lot of information that doesn't deal with Congress or the General Assembly. But boy, you get to the General Assembly and Congress and the Governor's office and the President's office, there's, uh, it's tougher to get some things. So I, I don't want to overstate that. I'm just saying that it's not quite as easy as necessarily going to the police department saying I'd like to see the police report on this. Uh, uh, this topic. I mean, I mean, some police departments are very open. Some police departments are just completely locked down. I'm just looking at the colors. Uh, I was wondering uh, if it relates to the literacy of the general population in as much as they are unable to access the news, if you want to call it that, or respond to different uh, things that would be uh, newsworthy. India, I'm looking at, mm -hmm. and uh, South Africa, and some of those countries um, who have to depend on people coming directly to them rather than yeah. the media. I suppose that could be a factor. I'm not. I'm not sure how that plays into it, but it may. Um, anyone know who this is? Very famous right now. Probably never heard his name two weeks ago. Uh, now Jamal Khashoggi uh, is a center of an international incident that, that has to do with freedom of the press and what what free press is like. And his particular situation, I think, is representative of what I spoke about earlier, government's aspect of free press as opposed to society's. Um, he was critical of his government, and he paid for that uh, with his life, apparently. Um, some other things we might think about about our free press. Has anyone seen this T-shirt? Rope free journalist. A rope tree journalist, that says. Rope tree journalist. Uh, some assembly required. That's a, uh, to many of us, rather scary t-shirt. Rather scary that some people would wear it. Um, and yet there's a free press issue. Free press, free speech issue here. What might it be? You're not allowed to wear this? Is Walmart not allowed to sell it? But when it began getting seen, some people complained, and Walmart took it off its shelves. <laughs> well, that's, uh, it's free press. Free, it's a free country. Um, I'll mention quickly, uh, at our borders, uh, this is the uh, Committee to Protect Journalists, where I'll have some uh, information. In fact, if you got some of the handouts that we passed out earlier, uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists lists uh, annually uh, the number of journalists who are killed in, by country and the number of journalists who are um, imprisoned in, in each country. And, and its website has a lot of other information about free press that's very interesting. Um, and notes that even in the United States, at our border, um, journalists who come at the border, um, they can have their laptops taken, they can have their phones taken, they can be forced to uh, divulge their passwords so that their material, their, back, their, um, uh, their notes and their background information, anything that they have that they might consider private or uh, even secret sources um, can be forced to be divulged there. Uh, so that may be one of the types of things that comes into this question of how free is our, our press. Note quickly here some of uh, the top uh, the countries that have the most jailed journalists, you see. Turkey is at the top. It has the most. Um, 
Well, I'd like to note this factor because Turkey and uh, Syria are in the news now, and I, th I find it very interesting that Turkey is uh, such a partner <laughs> in trying to identify who, who killed Mr. Khashoggi when Turkey has the most number of uh, journalists in jail. It is not exactly a paragon of, uh, of freedom, and uh, it falls to uh, where is Saudi? Saudi Arabia is number eight, so it's in Saudi Arabia is bad, not as bad as Turkey. Where are the most journalists killed? Um, again, I, you have that handout, and you can see exactly. I don't expect you to read the headline. I never thought you would read it, but it, it is somewhat eye-opening when you see this list of names, and, and you realize how, uh, how threatened a, a press can be and the things that, that people can be threatened by. Uh, with this uh, um, slide, I like to point out uh, Syria is where the most are killed, and it's pretty much by far. Um, and then you, you go down to, uh, you know, places like Libya, Honduras, Afghanistan. These are the worst. Philippines, Mexico. Uh, it's interesting to note, and if you look at the list that I gave you, you'll see it, it tells the reason that journalists were killed, each individual. Some of them are dangerous assignment. And Syria kind of is a blend of both. <laughs> it, it mistreats journalists from a government perspective, and it's just a dangerous place to be. So many journalists died just trying to cover that. Um, and just trying to, to be a free press and give people information. In Mexico, um, the issue is somewhat different. The issue is not, Mexico is not a dangerous place unless you're a journalist. And there it's more dangerous, not so much from the government, but from cartels and from other people who don't want to be reported on. And, um, and reporting about that sort of thing can land you uh, dead. And with that, I'll pass it back to John. I, I, I want to uh, respond again to the question about uh, what restrictions are we under. Uh, I've been in the newspaper business for quite some time, as you could probably guess. Uh, when I first started, uh, the hospitals were very free with uh, were very free with information. You could call a hospital, and you're on first name basis with the community relations people, and we'd routinely call to check on the condition reports from somebody who was in an accident or something like that. Uh, I don't remember when HIPAA was passed. When HIPAA was passed, uh, and there is this tension between public access and privacy, and, and, and I get that people do have a right to uh, uh, to privacy, and that's a whole that's a whole nother topic. We could have a whole nother series just on the privacy uh, matters, and, and so I understand the the uh, rationale for it, but it has now news now information is so locked down from the hospitals that. It's almost pointless to call a hospital to try to find out. We've had cases, uh, there are two I can think of, where, where uh, may, uh, the town's mayor were, were seriously, seriously ill, frankly, both times on their deathbeds, and we couldn't get, uh, because of HIPAA laws, we couldn't get any confirmation to tell their constituents the condition of, uh, the condition of their mayor. And to me, that takes it a little too far. You know, I understand the privacy thing, but... You know, if you're the mayor of the town, the, the public's got a right to know that uh, you're, you're uh, seriously ill, I think. And so they would divulge it if the family would agree. But the, the issue, here's a situation. The hospitals don't want to get sued. So if you've ever been to a hospital, frankly, I do blood tests. I mean, you've got to fill all this stuff up. You go get a blood test or anything else, and you've got to check all these boxes, all these boxes. And among the boxes are... Um, uh, not to tell anybody anything because they would rather err on the side of uh, of not telling people than to tell people because they can't get sued for not telling people. They can get sued for if they make a mistake and tell somebody something they haven't uh, uh, okayed on. So I mean, it's uh, I'm not saying this is the most horrendous thing in the world, but it is an example of how it makes it a little bit more a uh, little bit more difficult. So uh, we wanted to uh, talk a little bit about. Uh, uh, by the way, can, can you imagine only 13% of the people in that survey recognize that freedom of the press is protected by the First Amendment? 13%, that means 87%, if my math is good, 87% didn't know that. To me, maybe it's because I'm in the business and I assume everybody knows this, we talk about it all the time, but it's just kind of incredible to me. And it shows the challenge we have to uh, educate people.
And, and I'm not really sure what the answer is, is to that. Yeah. So um, we wanted to pose a few questions here related to uh, uh, freedom of press, freedom of speech. So this is, uh, this is the, da the Daily Herald. And I would imagine you all would agree that the newspaper in general should have uh, freedom to publish, probably with some restrictions, but in, in general, that that's not going to be too controversial here. And then, uh, well, Walter could do or say anything he wanted. I think we would all agree with uh, that. So, um, <clears throat> so how about uh, how about these two? Are you happy with their freedom of speech? All right, so here's a case. Uh, this was from out in, last year at the University of California, Berkeley. And, um, and Coulter was going to speak. The sponsors of her speech there, uh, you know, there was a huge controversy. Sp sponsors of her speech there uh, backed out, so she backed out. And this is a picture of, uh, of a conser uh, conservative activist, uh, Gavin McInnes, uh, reading her speech uh, on the campus. So thoughts about, thoughts about this free speech in the back. In all this so far, there's been no distinction between freedom of facts and freedom of opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're showing us a picture of Sean Hannity. Is he freedom of opinion, but is he free to his own facts? Mm -hmm. And you know, the whole title of this was Facts Matter. Mm -hmm. So that's just the question. Isn't there any mm -hmm. distinction at all between opinion and facts? I certainly think there is, yes. Uh, uh, th yeah. Uh, yes. Covered uh, presidency Obama and presidency of our duly elected President Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump, from the beginning, he is even didn't come into White House, and he was criticized and demonized, and still it it is. And when I read some uh, newspaper, I don't see. What he did that it is uh, uh, reflected in the newspaper uh, mm. that we have the the um, law the lowest number of uh, uh, unemployment rate in 50 years that we have blooming economy if compare with such a big president Obama what he did to, with in our country. It is unbelievable difference. But at the same time, so many people think that um, Trump is bad president. Uh, the only point I'll make with, with all of this is one to think about. And it's not, the, and I'm not arguing that uh, their rights to their opinion should be, should be um, restrained. I'm just saying that as uh, as uh, flawed as as the quote unquote mainstream news media is, as flawed as we at the Daily Herald are, uh, when we get up each day, uh, when we come together at work each day, it is our goal to find out what is happening and report it as the best we can. Some days we do that well. Some days I'm sure we screw up. Uh, the difference the difference here is that when Rachel Maddow goes to work each day she starts out her day wondering how can she, how can she uh, uh, how can uh, how can she go after uh, President Trump and when uh, Sean Hannity goes to work each day he goes at it thinking how can I defend President Trump or go after it go after his uh, enemies and there and there's a uh, and there's a, a difference and they all have the freedom they all have the freedom to say that uh, I would hope that we all uh, have the wisdom to understand uh, where they're where they're coming from we have rules against libel and slander but it seems like it doesn't apply to politicians they can call anybody names that they want I just wanted to know your opinion on that
just want to say one other thing. Um, I grew up in the 50s into the 60s. There were only four channels, okay? And the news, there was news on four channels. Now there's a million channels. You can shut the one off you don't want to hear. <laughs> Which doesn't mean that they're, they're wrong. But again, we talked about selective choices that we make about who we believe. And so this is, I think, why our country is so fragmenting, because there's an opinion for everybody, which, you know, which confuses the whole thing. Um, I wanted to make a comment going back to when you were talking about who should be permitted on campus to speak and whether that should. Um, if we go back to the 1968, which I have to admit that I was on campus at that point in time, and. Uh, I was at a small private college here in Chicago, and they invited Julian Bond. And they also had other people of the blank, Black Panthers and that. And being at a small school, it was, they considered it horrible. But everybody lined up and everybody went to the, con the uh, convocation, as they called it, to hear the speakers. You don't have to agree with them, but they have the right to, to be there. and. Um, yes, we had riots on campus and things like that that aren't in existence today. And I was just kind of throwing that out there because how things have changed, but they've stayed the same. Back in the 60s, we were protesting and working towards civil rights and rights for women. And they're being um, shadowed over today. And that's why something like we're doing tonight is important. Thank you. Uh, we got some comments in the back here. Uh, I, I'm looking at your question. You say, should this freedom be protected? Well, it is protected by the First Amendment. I, I, I think the question is, is that First Amendment protection being eroded? Maybe should be the question. I, I don't think it is. Uh, I think there's a difference in the protection that's afforded. Newspapers have a wide protection on the First Amendment because they're essentially businesses, uh, in a sense, private. They print, and th there's no regulation in that sense. The airways are somewhat not quite as protected because they're licensed by the government. So the government has some say, particularly in the license that are gra granted originally in the, and before cable came along. So you, you have the FCC uh, somewhat regulating the major airways and less protection on the cable. And I have no idea, we should probably be talking about internet, what protections or no protections are in the internet system. So I'm not quite sure you're, uh, I, think, I think we're protected right now. Is that eroded or what can erode it? Thank you. Um, I don't disagree with you, but to play devil's advocate, I think um, you stated, or and I paraphrase, that um, Fox News has uh, a right to say anything they want, but hopefully uh, we as intelligent uni uh, human beings can filter out what's fact and what's opinion, and I wonder why you make that assumption when Fox News is, in fact, uh, one of the, uh, they're the largest following of cable news, and they have to be one of the largest uh, news organizations which people follow. And in that regard, um, and I ask this in sincerity, not to cause an argument or whatnot, but there must be uh, somebody in the audience who is a supporter of the present government and administration. And I wonder if they would like to comment on, do they realize that what uh, Fox News uh, perpetrates is uh, propaganda or uh, or do they agree that it may be false, but it doesn't really matter to them uh, because 
uh, on our statement of Thomas Jefferson, you know, he said that something to the effect uh, that truth and rationality should be the basis. And I don't see that truth and rationality is the basis at all. Uh, so consequently, I wonder, as part of an anti-administration, uh, in the pursuit of understanding, and it's, I'm not arguing and I'm not shouting and screaming, uh, but I would like somebody in the audience who is a supporter of the present administration to give their opinion as to whether they realize that Fox News is a false uh, news source and whether it really makes any difference to them one way or another. Number one, uh, I don't watch cable. I don't have cable. I don't watch CNN. I don't watch Fox News. And the gentleman here is more than entitled to his opinion. Uh, oh, I, I, you most certainly did. Uh, secondly, um, even though we're in a very blue portion of the state, the state of Illinois, red and blue, mirrors the United States as far as it's red and blue. And, uh, well, we're all Americans. Am I not treating you as such? Well, that's your opinion. The president has some very strong opinions. I don't agree with all of them. But I do agree that it was the states with lower population who are more agrarian uh, and closer to the fact that uh, nature, weather, and things beyond politics determine what kind of a year they're going to have and what kind of an economic situation they're going to have. Uh, these folks are much different than the folks who live in the big cities, uh, in the coasts, in uh, Chicago, around uh, uh, St. Louis. Uh, and it's simply these folks and the electoral college uh, who have spoken, and uh, that's just the way it is. That's what our that's what our Constitution says. We have a constitutional convention. And hey, you know, I'm not always happy about the election either. But that's the way it is, and that's the way we're going to have to, to deal with it until someone else is in there. The United States and throughout the world. And, uh, you know, the Internet is basically wild man country. I mean, you can go on anything and find an opinion that you agree with. And, you know, many of the policies that we have gotten rid of have contributed to it. There was the FCC, the FCC Fairness Doctrine at one time, where everybody had to give equal time for their opinions, was back in the 80s, stopped. I don't, I forget why. We have now huge conglomerates buying up medias. And, you know, so that less and less divergence, you know, of opinions are, I, I, I'm not quite explaining myself, but it's just, this is the, this is what happens. And uh, at the, inter the internet hasn't really, it's helped a lot, but it has also has its negatives. And they appear are not necessarily freedom of speech, but freedom of entertainment. I mean, these are um, people who are, you know, throwing red meat to, their, to feed their own supporters or their own groups. And um, they, I think the real, and so you can sort of, you can look at these people and you can decide whose side you're on. Um, and, and people go there primarily to hear their, get, to be in an echo chamber and to be entertained. Uh, but I think the real risks come from um, 
things that we, that we touched on earlier in the series is their freedom of, of speech that protects the internet liars, you know, the false news that comes over. And you're seeing industry respond to that now. And when you're seeing Facebook try to police, you know, what is posted, when you're seeing um, some efforts to restrain speech, and is that right um, or is it wrong? But you can see if it's if it's not if if there aren't some sort of controls or methods utilized, it can affect all of our lives, and it, it can affect elections. It can affect um, it can it can result in, in people being killed because there other people act on misinformation. Alexander Hamilton was the one who started the uh, electoral college. Yeah, I think so. I did too. Um, but when you look at 30 years ago, was there a Fox News? No. And 30 years ago, the reason why is because we didn't have cable as much as we do now. Fox News was actually started because it was a general feeling of most conservatives that the three major networks were liberal. They had no way of getting their word out. That's why Rush Limbaugh became so popular and is a multi multi-millionaire to this day. And that's why Fox News started. All these news programs basically, as most businesses are, they want profit. How do you get profit? You get people on the television to watch so they, they can charge their people. Uh, money. So Fox News or CNBC or CNN, because I remember when it used to be called the Clinton News Network, and uh, they're just basically listening to the people that are watching them, and they're giving them what they want. Not necessarily what may be true, may be factual, but they're actually giving them. And as that one gentleman said, it's more entertainment than it is actually any kind of news. If you want, uh, when the, the reason that Franklin said to that woman, a republic, if we can keep it, he knew that unless the citizens participated that the country was not going to be what it was what it was set out to be and if you have like you said about the, the percentage I'd make you a bet you could walk down the street now and ask the same question and you'll probably get about the same same percentage on my computer I have Microsoft news which include CNN Politica, Huffington Post, and almost never uh, I have uh, Fox News. Sometimes, and it is like uh, um, they took some, uh, compile some what's uh, not uh, really uh, reflect what's in all that material. That's what, uh, and, uh, un, uh, um, what are we going to do? We've got several slides to get through here. So I thought what we might do is if we can go through this next uh, handful fairly quickly. Um, if anybody wants to comment, we get one comment, and then we're going to move on to the next one, unless we hit something that's, that's just going to bring the house down, okay? And uh, so, so this was, uh, we talked about this, and then this is a response to um, another uh, speech at the uh, University of California at Berkeley, which was uh, last year, that prompted uh, riots by the, uh, by the opposition. So I would imagine we think that uh, when you start burning things, that should not be protected uh, freedom of speech. So uh, it used to be that you would see nativities on government and government property around Christmas time all the time. You don't. Uh, you don't anymore, unless 
unless they go to great efforts to make sure virtually every religion is uh, accounted for. Um, is that the way it should be or not? Is that people are not educating philosophy or logic anymore uh, in the traditional educational way. So now when someone states an objective truth, which is tr tr objective truth is a truth that exists outside oneself. When someone states an objective truth and somebody disagrees with it or doesn't like it, they'll, they'll, you, they'll, you, they'll say you're a bully, you're a hater, you're a bigot, you're a fill-in-the-blank phobic, and then you can't say that. It's hate speech. And so you, you have people, particularly, typically on the left, that are now saying that you cannot, they're, they're trying to remove the freedom of speech now because it's all emotionalism. And that's where the society is degenerated into. And that gets into like this, this picture here with the rioting. They didn't, they didn't like what somebody was saying, and there was probably some truth to it, and their only response is an emotional outburst instead of something intellectual. Thank you very much. Colin Kaepernick uh, 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 kneeling uh, uh, during the national anthem. Yes. I believe this is no worse than the, the possibly the same athletic event, a parachuter comes down with a flag, lands and drags the flag behind him before he stops. To me, that's desecration of the flag. This isn't because this is an expression of their feelings about something. You may not agree with that, but that's their expression. So. It doesn't cost anybody anything for this person to kneel. Okay. How about this one, Tim Tebow, uh, Tim Tebow praying on the, on the field? The, the real question here is, this is a tweet from the president um, regarding the Russia investigation, the Mueller investigation, which he repeatedly calls a witch hunt. Um, is there any problem with oh, that? I see where she's got the problem that we yeah, got a typo a, here. Yeah, not, I don't know. In June of 2017, he issued this statement. You're witnessing the Rice witch hunt in the political history led by some very bad and conflicted people. The man behind you. I think it's inappropriate um, for this tweet to go out like this. I think his tweeting is absurd anyway. But... Um, <laughs> It's, um, he's the chief law enforcement officer according to the Constitution, and the Justice Department is investigating a serious concern by the American public. It's appropriate to do the investigation. I think it's inappropriate for Trump to try and circumvent it. Okay. And that is the greatest concern that, that people mentioned regarding it. Um, Excuse me. Today was a okay. good example of what his his tweets and his his uh, rallies and and the hate speech that co that comes out of it, those bombs that were <coughs> sent to all these uh, Democrats, you know, it's just kind of scary. And I, and hopefully it'll stop, but I don't know if it ever will. I don't think his tweets uh, have anything to do with what happened today. There's been much more hate thrown out by our higher ups in the Democratic Party, Eric Holder, Hillary Clinton, um, and various others, advocating for violence. Trump's tweet did not advocate for violence. And he, even if he is the President of the United States, he has the right to defend himself, too. And the witch hunt has proved to be a witch hunt. Okay, so we're talking about freedom of the speech. We had also, uh, yeah. So uh, one thing first, I just want to point this this one out because uh, we talked about the freedoms that the Constitution guarantees. One of them is that we can we can peaceably um, assemble. Uh, is there any problem if you peaceably assemble in the middle of Lakeshore Drive? Some of them did, but they didn't have permission to go quite as far as they as they went. Yes. I support the uh, the right to uh, protest and make your opinions known, but I think this is disruptive to a lot of people who may have the same sentiments or may not 
but their life is disrupted at that point in time when they can't reach home or maybe medical attention or some other very important thing in their life and it could be costing some people uh, substantial. And this is a rational way of going about it. And when Thomas Jefferson says that it should be decided on truth and facts and rationalities, it shouldn't be decided emotionally and whatnot. Decide what's important to you. If freedom of the press is important to you, vote accordingly. And if it's not important to you, Vote accordingly. Okay. Um, um, let's move on real quickly. I want to point this one out. This is very recent. Roseanne Barr made this statement regarding uh, Valerie Jordan, and uh, she lost her job over it. How can we say we have free speech when she lost her job? How can we say she, we had free press when she simply stated her opinion, but she lost her job? If she had free She didn't get put in jail. And so I would like to emphasize that there are different ways to look at what freedom of the press means and what freedom of speech means, that there are consequences to our speech, regardless of where we are. And, um, and she suffered consequences um, related to the society. Um, you mentioned that, and I don't know why I'm going back to the down so Back to you. Oh, uh, real quickly, this, this slide is, do you know who this is? Uh, this was Michelle Wolf. She spoke to the um, uh, White House Correspondents' Dinner, which is generally a uh, function that's held every year where the press gets together with the president and they make fun of each other and laugh and ha ha and pretend that they get along. And she uh, gave her speech, and it was very critical of the press and very critical of, of the president at the same time and rather vulgar in a, in a lot of ways as well. So there was a lot of criticism about that. Go ahead, John. Okay, I'm blanking on the name of uh, this person, but he's he is the uh, he is the baker who um, is uh, religious who said his religious views. Uh, Jack Phillips. Yes, uh, <clears throat> made it uh, made it so that uh, he couldn't uh, bring himself to uh, bake a wedding cake for a, a gay couple, and this uh, ended up ended up in court. This is, this is Lenny Bruce. How many of you remember Lenny Bruce? Um, Lenny Bruce uh, was, uh, um, was in court uh, probably more often than he was on the comedy stage and uh, uh, frankly had been con convicted of uh, conspiracy and of obscenity uh, when he uh, uh, was out on appeal when he, uh, when he passed away for saying things that frankly is pretty uh, uh, Pretty t well, I, I don't know if it's tame, but it's pretty commonplace today. If you go to a comedy club, or if you turn on cable news, or you just listen to conversations, um, uh, so is it good that the country's uh, uh, come a long way since then, or is it uh, not good? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I mean, I think if you listen to uh, FCC uh, broadcasts. Uh, you, you don't hear it on those broadcasts, but you certainly hear it on cable and you hear it everywhere else. Comment somewhere. Uh, uh, yeah. You raised a couple issues and we went past them. Uh, I'd like to go back to the religious symbol of, uh, you don't have to show the picture, but we had the, uh, the nativity scene. Uh, that's an instance where government is promoting a religion by putting a religious symbol on government property. Uh, I, I don't I think the Constitution and uh, I think the majority, I hope the majority feels that the government is not in the business of promoting a religion. You could put those in front of churches, you could put them in front of your home, but you can't put something, the government cannot promote a particular religion. Uh, I think the question of decorating the, in the court case, the Supreme Court case, where you had uh, the bakers uh, defending his rights to sell a cake, I think the difference is in selling a service or uh, a product uh, such as this, uh, if you have to, if the baker had to put on that cake 
something that uh, does not agree with his religious feelings. That's one thing. I think he has a right. He doesn't have to put something on that cake to promote um, whatever cause or whatever group of people. But for someone to come into the store and buy a cake and denying him because of his orientation, that is a separate issue. And I think the distinction has to be made. Uh, I, I, you can't ask a person who walks into a business and say, what's your religious affiliation? What's your gender affiliation? And I will decide whether to serve you or to let you buy my product. I think there's this, uh, there has to be some protection and protection both ways. I believe, I believe that uh, the Ten Commandments are uh, displayed over uh, the Supreme Court building. And I don't know how many other um, uh, office buildings, uh, government office buildings that, uh, that they may be displayed in and, and carved into, but I just recently saw that uh, pictures of of the, the Ten Commandments and uh, Moses. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, uh, a Nazi uh, march in Chicago back in the, I think it was the late 70s. Originally they were going to march in Skokie. There's a huge uproar. Uh, they were going to march in Skokie, a, a predominantly Jewish, uh, Jewish community. They went to the courts. They won on a, uh, I think it was a, uh, 5-4 vote of the Supreme Court and then so they won the right to a march but then they decided not to march there they went to Chicago instead um, so should Nazis have uh, the right to march if you know they filled out the permits and in particular should they have a right to march in a community that is in particular I will say that as a res as a response to this, the community opened up a storefront Holocaust Museum, which since was uh, uh, <coughs> which since became you know, the, the forerunner of the Holocaust Museum that is uh, over there right now. Uh, this is the New York Times on the Pentagon on the Pentagon Papers uh, published the Pentagon Papers. This is quite a quite a uh, uh, fight over that. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg. A, a Vietnam vet who worked for the Pentagon and then the Rand Corporation leaked uh, the information. He was tried. He was. It was thrown out uh, when, when, when it became clear that the uh, Nixon administration had you know, tapped his, uh, his psychiatrist's office. Um, so it was thrown out based on government misconduct. Uh, the New York Times has sued uh, over pu over publication. Nineteen different newspapers published uh, this. And the courts, I think, on a six to three vote, the Supreme Court uh, granted their granted um, their permission to uh, to publish. And uh, the ra and uh, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, what the Pentagon Papers were actually about, but it was less about revealing government secrets and more about revealing three years, uh, three decades of, frankly, falsehoods in terms of how. They described uh, the Vietnam War. Beg your pardon? Yes, uh, the, the post is about that, yes. Yes. And uh, both the New York Post and the New York Times, the, the Washington Post and the New York Times were in on that at the, essentially at the same time. Uh, this is Larry Flint. He uh, has spent a, lot, spent a lot of time in uh, courts, as, uh, courts as well. He was convicted of obscenity for. Uh, this Hustler magazine was a very graphic uh, 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 magazine. This was back in, I think, 1979, 1980 or so. He was uh, convicted in this, in this case. He was also, uh, I think it was around this case where he was uh, shot by someone when he was coming out of court. Um, he served six days in uh, jail as a result of this, uh, this and then was out on appeal and essentially won his appeal. So. Yes, yes. And this is uh, Alex Jones, who's uh, 
been banned by Twitter, or at least Twitter has uh, tried to uh, ban him for uh, presumably promoting uh, conspiracy theories and uh, hate speech and, uh, and this type of thing. Should he be banned from uh, Twitter, or uh, should he be allowed to spew uh, conspiracy theories or hate speech? Mm -hmm. What he said back here is Twitter is a private company. They should have the rules to do whatever. I know what that. Yeah. Edward Snowden, uh, comment over here. Yes. Uh, question: yes. Doesn't the First Amendment just restrict government impairment of free yes. speech? Correct. It, you know, doesn't talk about what parents can tell their kids not to say or what employers can or cannot imposed in the workplace? Correct. I mean, unless there are other government, prote uh, government, te government protections. There are in some states government protections for employees. Uh, uh, for instance, if they say something uh, outlandish on social media, some states uh, have some protections that uh, employees can't, uh, you know, can't go after them about something that occurred outside the workplace. It's certainly true that we get a lot of letters to the editor that we don't publish because we think they're not appropriate or they're um, offensive in some way. We have the right as a newspaper to decide not, not to publish them. Even They have the right to say them. They have the right to send them to us, but we don't have to publish them. Uh, so Edward Snowden is in Russia right now is, uh, um, because he would be, he would be uh, prosecuted if he was here. So does that make sense to everybody uh, that he should in? He is the he is the uh, businessman uh, um, from I think it's Alabama who uh, who sued over the limitations on campaign funding, and so this uh, big Supreme Court ruling from um, I think it was four years ago, maybe five six years ago, was based on his case, and essentially the Supreme Court ruled that that he can give as much campaign money as he wants to the national party or to national or to federal uh, candidates. And anywhere, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, this is a precedent that applies anywhere. So, Citizens United, right? So, so, uh, good, bad. Should should is that a uh, freedom of speech protection? Is giving money a freedom of speech? Okay, and then we end with uh, J.B. Pritzker, who is running for governor, and most people expect he's going to be elected governor. He's uh, so far contributed $161 million to his campaign, which has set a national national uh, record. And then uh, anonymous sources, should they be protected? It should be t protected under freedom of speech, but you should take and make a judgment that if he's doing this anonymously, then it may not be credible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Well, one more comment right here. Uh, that's true, but I, I, I think uh, in your situation, it, you quote anonymous sources, right? Beg your pardon? The Herald. They'll use anonymous sources, right? Uh, we use anonymous sources, but we're very restrictive. Of, uh, uh, but, we're but very restrictive. Uh, we don't do it very much. But if you did uh, national newspapers, uh, well, let's let's just do it locally. But if you had a national uh, kind of a local scandal of some sorts, and you had an anonymous uh, bit of information, you would use it as long as you could corroborate it, right? We would use it as long as we could corroborate it, and as long as we believed it's information we couldn't get anywhere else, and as long as we thought it was in the uh, public's interest. Quickly on libel, truth, malice, and freedom. I'll just mention, uh, our time is running short, so I, I'll try not to go too deeply into this complex case, but it was a case, this is a case that answers someone's question uh, earlier, can politicians say anything they want to about each other? And the fact is, yes, they can. Um, and anybody can say just about anything that you want, um, true or not true. Truth, uh, to a large extent, libel has always been seen as the, the check on uh, bases that went overboard on freedom of, of speech. It was always assumed, well, if you libel someone, then you could 
be sued, and, and therefore you would be more careful about what you say about them. Um, in 1964, uh, a case involving a, um, a, a police commissioner who felt that he was libeled by uh, the New York Times, um, sued them. Supreme Court said, hey, he's a public official, and free press is so important, and getting information about government is so important to, um, to the public that had, there has to be a very high standard to show that um, they screwed up, that they made, did something wrong. And therefore, um, because of that ruling, New York Times versus Sullivan, it was stated that um, you had to show actual malice if, it, if you say something about a political person or a person who's in the public eye. You have to prove, and by actual malice, that meant you wanted to hurt them. You knew or should have known that it was wrong, and, and, um, and you published it anyway and caused them great damage. Uh, you can publish something that that you know is wrong and not cause them great damage and still get away with that. Um, and that's how open that, that particular uh, ruling has, has become. And it's very important in, in terms of allowing uh, open dialogue. It has changed our, uh, our dialogue about politics um, uh, pretty dramatically. Um, I mentioned earlier, I talked about the Roseanne situation. We've talked about many others where there's a real difference between official speech and and uh, general society speech, and I would just emphasize here that consequences is the key word, that we, there are consequences to our speech regardless of whether we're allowed to say them or not. Um, I, I like to point this one out because I think there are some huge differences that are important to recognize that we see as a newspaper. We do recognize differences between private people and people in the public eye. We won't report a lot of things about uh, different individuals, uh, the private people. We don't, we have rules against publishing uh, the names of witnesses to crime. We have rules against publishing the names of certain victims of, of crime because we recognize their privacy and we're less likely to uh, withhold those from others. Uh, I would ask you to think about um, politicians versus other public people. The law actually is pretty similar. You can say almost anything you want to about Roseanne Barr. You can say almost anything you want to about President Trump or President Obama uh, because they're in the public eye. You can't necessarily say that about any of you because you have a more of a right to privacy in, in your private views. Um, and then I'll let John take it from here as we talk about some of the things. Uh, the, again, that sheet that I passed out from you has this also. We asked some of our um, editors to say, you know, tell us, what, what does the First Amendment mean to you? And here's some of the thoughts that they had. Sorry we've, gone on, sorry, we've gone on so long. We're uh, about to wrap up here. Um, so um, finally, this is really what the session is about, is, uh, you know, what's the role of the press? Uh, what's the role of the press? And um, we were going to ask you what you think the role of the press is, but I think we'll save a little bit of time. I, and uh, So here are among the things that the, the, uh, we think are part of the role of the press. Uh, uh, certainly as a newspaper, it's our job to, re to try to reflect your world, um, both the good and the bad in it, to reflect your voice to those in power, uh, to help reflect your voice to those in power, to help build a sense of community, uh, certainly to ferret out, relay, and archive information, to increase your understanding, uh, to monitor government. Studies have shown that governments that operate uh, with a monitor are more frugal with money than governments that operate knowing that nobody's looking over their shoulder. Um, just like with my budget, I'm sure if the boss wasn't asking me what, you know, wasn't paying attention to how I'm spending the money, I might spend a little bit more. Right, Bob? And uh, uh, acting as a watchdog was one of our most important uh, roles, uh, providing for a marketplace of ideas challenging your perspective, uh, encouraging you to think, fostering, uh, fostering debate. Um, and I'm sure there are a few other roles in there that uh, we've left off the list. Um, this is uh, Jake Griffin. He's our, ta our tax watchdog uh, uh, editor. And uh, he, is reg he regularly watches how um, uh, local governments and state governments spend, uh, spend our money. And, uh, um, as an example of that, uh, <coughs> pension uh, 
fund shortages and, and, and the like. He's, and he's in the paper regularly with this, uh, this kind of thing. Um, so over the past uh, several years, here, here are a few things that we thought, and you know, the, it's, it's an endless list, but Daily Herald, if the Daily Herald wa wasn't here, uh, we have helped, uh, we have helped uh, after the Fox River Grove crash, um, uh, frankly became more expert on, uh, 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 on railroad crossing synchronization than frankly the people who actually did it. And uh, that led to uh, safer rail crossings where there's much more synchronization between the time the uh, lights at the intersection are going to turn and the gates and the gates go up. I didn't say I was technologically uh, fine. Uh, 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 we've uh, done projects that have uh, led to state laws that reduce the tax gap that schools used to suffer between the time that. Uh, the time that um, they were due the bills and due the revenue, and the time that they got their revenue. Remind me what JUST is. Uh, it's an organization in DuPage County that uh, helped, uh, that watched over um, the criminal justice system and helped uh, inmates. And there was uh, the sheriff just decided to eliminate them on, on a whim. Up with training with uh, with inmates. Inmates. Yeah. And the sheriff is going to uh, the sheriff is going to eliminate the program. We wrote we wrote uh, considerably about it, and they reinstated the program. Um, we have uh, uh, good schools. The paper's foundation has been to uh, uh, promote uh, promote good good schools, and we do have a lot of great schools around here. It's not just because the Daily Herald is in uh, the corner of education, but uh, we've certainly viewed ourselves as an ally of that over the over the years and, uh, and and as a matter of fact one of our one of the paddock family members from uh, a, from a different generation there's there's a school in Palatine named after him which is really kind of a reflection of the of the company's role on that um, uh, there's school safety laws now there was a, a teacher who was attacked by a student in uh, in Elgin a few years ago and we wrote about that and followed up with it on that, and and our coverage really uh, led to a uh, law that uh, allows for better communication of uh, of uh, potential uh, dangerous students between police and uh, the school districts. Uh, we have uh, we have uh, written extensively on the heroin and the opioid crisis, and I wouldn't say we alone are responsible for increased uh, availability of uh, of. Uh, uh, Nalazone, which can stop someone from dying, uh, uh, who, who is on a, is overdosed on heroin, uh, but we're a part of that. Um, Jake's uh, Jake's coverage of, of, of political uh, of local politicians' uh, abuses of uh, travel spending that led to a law that restricts how much spending uh, uh, they can do on uh, local travel. Uh, we have uh, done coverage on uh, severance agreements that are. That uh, that uh, there was a severance agreement tied to, uh, a, 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 frankly, a sexual assault, sexual harassment claims, and uh, we pushed uh, to uh, ensure that that was uh, transparent, that it wasn't just an agreement that, uh, that uh, the school board made with the superintendent and everybody moved on. They, they uh, as a result of our push for that, uh, that was District 62 a couple years ago. They did come forward and said exactly why there was a severance. But after that, the state passed a law essentially saying in cases like this, you have to have transparency. Um, uh, we've been reporting right now on uh, nepotism and no-bid contracts at the uh, Tollway Authority that's gotten uh, a lot of examination from the state. Uh, we've, uh, we've, ex we've explored uh, the uh, link between uh, income and academic uh, success. And our, our coverage, I think everybody's always assumed that there is some truth to that. I think our coverage showed just how indelibly and how, how deeply ingrained uh, that is. I'm sorry, I dropped the mic. Uh, Northwest Community Hospital was, uh, was built uh, uh, partly with Daily Herald support, or Herald support back then. Uh, lead testing is required in public schools now, and that's a direct result of coverage that Jake uh, Griffin did on uh, lead on uh, lead in the suburban water. And uh, we weren't the only uh, organization to um, 
write about the uh, county soda tax or to editorialize about it, but we were we were very heavily involved, and that tax uh, went away partly to our credit. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, I'm not going to go through all of these, but here are some celebrated, uh, you know, national international stories that are really a result of a vigorous uh, of a vigorous uh, free free press. Uh, all of these things happened. Uh, because of because of a free press, and um, Benjamin Franklin, whoever would overthrow the liberty of a nation must begin by subduing the freeness of speech. Um, we've got several quotes here to uh, several quotes here to end on. I like some more than others, uh, and some are a little uh, critical of us. I'll leave it up here a little bit long enough for you to to uh, read it. One of the slower readers in the group give me the high sign when I can click here. And, uh, and these are also in the handouts that we had too. These are also in the handouts. And uh, they inspire us. And uh, we thought we would end with several. Um, We'll get that in just a second. Okay, we're almost done here, and uh, and I want to I want to show the last quote because actually of all these quotes, um, just like the founders, they're almost all male. But there is a uh, female at the end who I think says probably to, uh, as a comment that I like the best. There's an urgent need today for the citizens of a democracy to think well. It is not enough to have freedom of the press and parliamentary institutions. Our difficulties are due partly to our own stupidity, partly to the exploitation of that stupidity, and partly to our own prejudices and personal desires. Uh, this uh, uh, Susan Stebbing was was a um, was um, I'm blanking. I told Jim I was going to blank on something, and I'm blanking on this. Um, I can't remember. I can't remember what she was, um, but uh, but but she was from uh, she was from uh, early in the 19th century. So she's not talking about today, but I think a lot. I think what she says could resonate with a lot of people uh, today, and it really under, underscores our fundamental our fundamental theme, which is uh, this that uh, you know knowledge will forever govern ignorance. This is James Madison, our fourth president. And the people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with power which knowledge gives. If there's one message that we want to get across tonight, it is the obligation of, of the citizenry uh, uh, to, be a, to be actively engaged in seeking the truth and in seeking knowledge and to challenge your, and to challenge your own views and not, to not take things with face value. We say that we say at the newsroom that um, it is important for us to be skeptical, not cynical, and that is a message that we give to all of you. And that uh, you know we would hope everyone in the uh, everyone in the country would follow. That uh, we all have need to be skeptical. We all have need to use our critical thinking skills to to question things and to challenge things and see what adds up and what doesn't add up. Uh, but it's not good for us, and it's not good for the nation if we all grow cynical, and because then we're essentially saying, "Well, we give up." So, so thank you very much. That's the uh, that's the end of our program. We appreciate all the conversation, and uh, appreciate you coming out. Sorry, we went a little long tonight.